Okay, so that is the second video about random vectors. And here we will discuss what is the covariance matrix of a random vector. And we will see that is a quantity which replaces the concept of variance, which we know for random variables. Okay, so let's see what that is. The covariance matrix of a vector, I first write the definition, is covariance of Z, say which is the matrix which is made of covariance Z1, Z1, up to covariance of Z1, Zn in the first row, then covariance Z2, Z1, all the way up to covariance Z2, Zn in the second row, and then all the way down until covariance Zn, Z1, up to covariance Zn, Zn in the last row. So that the square matrix R n times n. My aim is just to discuss properties of this matrix. Before we go on, let me just remind you what is the covariance of random variables which we used in here. So covariance of random variables x and y is, there are two definitions, you can either define it to be expectation of x, y minus expectation of x times expectation of y, or alternatively, you can define it as expectation of x minus expectation of x times y minus expectation of y. And one can show these two expressions, even if they look a bit different, give the same thing. Great, and there are a number of rules, which I just want to remind you. So covariance of x plus y, z, for example, is covariance x, z plus covariance y, z, and covariance a, x, y is a covariance x, y. So these together mean the covariance is linear in the first argument. And you need to be a bit careful there to not confuse it with variances. Variances numbers come out as squares, but covariance a here leads still to a here. It's linear in its first argument. Then more rules of the standard covariance. It's a metric. Covariance x, y is covariance y, x. And if you use this together with the previous rule, then you get it's also linear in the second argument, because with this rule, you can flip it over, use linearity, and flip it back. And finally, the last important thing to know is the variance of x can be written as the covariance of x with itself. And the rule I just mentioned, let's just verify whether that's compatible with what we just said. The variance of Ax is meant to be a squared times variance of x. And if we use covariances, then well, we get this directly from what I wrote here. And then I said it's linear in the first argument. So we can write a times covariance of x Ax. I took that out to the front. Then it's also linear in the second argument, so we can write a squared times covariance of x with itself, where I put this a also in front. And finally, covariance of x with itself is the variance, so we get back the rule we already know. So that's all consistent. The question is now, using these rules for covariances, what can we learn about the covariance of a vector? The first thing we can see is it's a metric. So covariance of zi, zj is covariance zj, zi. And from that, we see covariance z is symmetric, which means if I take the transpose, nothing changes. I get the same matrix. Then the second property I want to write, you will see if you remember what I just explained about normal variances. Here on the diagonal, we have covariance of Z1 with Z1, and so on up to covariance Zn with Zn. So these are actually variances. So what we have is covariance of Z in row i, column i, is variance of Zi. Next thing that will help us with our epsilon is there is a special case when Z has independent components. If the components Zi are independent, then covariance Zij is covariance of Zi and Zj. And independent random variables have zero covariance, so that is zero if i is different from j. 
So in this case, covariance Z is a diagonal matrix. And with this, we can straight away work out what's the covariance of epsilon in our model. So covariance of epsilon, we now know from the rule up here. On the diagonal, we have the variance of epsilon, and that is sigma squared. So on the diagonal, we have sigma squared, sigma squared, up to sigma squared down here. And from what I just said here, we know all of diagonal elements are zero. So we have zero here, zero here. So covariance of epsilon, we already know. There are a few more rules. So for example, covariance of x plus b, say where b is a fixed vector, a non-random vector, equals covariance of x for all b in Rn. And that follows directly from the corresponding property of the normal covariance. So covariance x plus b rho i column j is covariance x plus b i's component with covariance x plus b j's component. And that's covariance of xi plus bi xj plus bj. And now there are different ways to do that, but in any case, so I just write dots here, that's about one dimensional covariances, which I hope you know. It turns out the constants don't matter and we get covariance xi with xj. Good, and with this rule, we can work out what the covariance of y in the model. So covariance of y in the model is covariance of x beta plus epsilon. And x beta looks complicated, but it's just a constant vector. So that's the same as covariance of epsilon. And that we have just worked out. That's just sigma squared times the identity matrix. Good. Now, the next properties I want to explain need a tiny bit more linear algebra. So first, let me write the claim. If expectation of z equals zero, then the covariance of z can be written as the expectation of z times z transpose. Let me write the dimensions again. z is a vector, so if we write it like this, we think of it as a column vector, an n times one matrix, and then by the same logic, z transpose is a one times n matrix. So this whole expression z, z transpose is a n by n matrix that fits at least in the dimensions because the covariance is also an n by n matrix. And I just want to check now, give you a proof that that is true. So what do we need to do? First thing, z the transpose in row i column k is, well, technically that would be j from one to one, z i j z transpose j k. The reasoning is this one here is the middle dimension and I have to sum over the rows of this, but the rows have length one, and over the columns of that, the columns also have length one, and then I multiply the elements and add them up. But again, there is only one term in the sum, so nothing interesting happens with the sum. And the transpose here just swaps the arguments, so that's z, k, j. So what we get is z, i, I don't know, I can write the one or not, it's a vector, so there is only one column, times zk1, and that really is zi times zk. And then we know covariance of zi with zk is expectation of zi zk minus expectation of zi times expectation of zk. That was one of the two definitions. And these two expectations equal zero, so that just equals expectation of zi times zk. And now I'm nearly here. Namely, I want to show something about the full covariance matrix. And that thing here really is the element in row i column j of that covariance matrix. So let me just put that together. We want covariance matrix of z row i column j. We know that covariance 
I should write column K here to be consistent with the previous slide. We know that's covariance Z I Z K. Then from what I just wrote is we know that that is expectation of Z I multiplied with Z K. So let me first do that. That is Z Z transpose rho I column J. And then one can define the expectation of this matrix in the same way as we did it for vectors. So we just take the indices out and then that shows covariance Z is expectation of Z, Z transpose. And that's what I set out to prove. Okay, so we have this. And now that assumed expectation of Z equals zero. If that's not the case, then what we can do is we can just subtract the expectation of Z. So for general Z, we have covariance matrix of Z is, I explained it earlier, we can shift it around. So we can do Z minus expectation of Z, subtract or add a constant vector. That doesn't change anything. And this vector here now has expectation zero because I just subtracted the expectation. So here we get from the previous result expectation of Z minus E of Z, Z minus E of Z transpose. Good. And that's the general rule. I proved this one in the notes in one go without the previous step. I'm not sure which one you will find easier to read. Good. And then let me skip a few things. I think the only interesting part here is of the remaining rules that we can work out the covariance of AZ, so matrix times vector. And there something slightly interesting happens, namely that does not just come out. So it's not just A times covariance Z, but there is a second A transpose at the end. So covariance of AZ is A covariance Z times A transpose. And this is because this covariance, despite its name, replaces the variance of random variables. So that's kind of a squared quantity. I showed you earlier, if you take a number out of the variance, it comes out as a square. And this covariance matrix, even if it's called covariance, it's really more like a variance. So that has the same property. If I take the matrix A out, it doesn't quite come out as a square, but we have two of them here. So if there was numbers, then I could combine them into an A squared. And for matrices, order of multiplication happens, so I need to have them carefully arranged. And turns out we need an A at front and an A transpose at the back. So let me show you how that's done. So the proof is covariance A Z rho I column J is covariance A Z I A Z J. And actually different from the notes, I think it is better if I subtract the mean first. So let's write here, assume expectation A Z equals zero. We can get rid of any mean there is using the same trick we just used here. So we can assume that without any loss of generality. And then we can use the rule with less writing. So that is the expectation of A Z A Z transpose from the same rule as we used it here. And then we need to be a bit careful. Transpose of a product switches the order. So that's expectation of A Z Z transpose A transpose. And now we can take out the A's. That's one of the rules of expectations. Expectation of A times something is A times the expectation of something. And turns out that it also works on the right. And so we get A covariance Z A transpose. And that was the case where the expectation is zero. And the general case we can do like that. I have to say that came out much tidier than it is in the notes. So in the notes, I didn't assume that. And when you read this, you will see it looks much more messy. It's the same argument, but we always need to subtract the mean in here and everything looks a bit more complicated. I should have done it like that straight away. Good, we have a nice version here. And then there is a last result in the notes. I want to do that only very quickly here. So covariance Z is positive semi-definite, which means U transpose covariance that U is greater or equal to zero for all vectors U in Rn. And the proof we can again without loss 
of generality assume expectation of z equals zero. If it isn't, we can subtract it in here without changing the covariance until it is. And then u transpose covariance z u is u transpose expectation z z transpose u by what we just learned. And then I can take in these vectors again, same as at the end of the previous proof. So that is expectation u transpose z z transpose u. And now I define a shorthand, say v is defined to be z transpose u. Then we have expectation of, well, there's a v here. And my claim is here we get a v transpose. Let's just check v transpose is z transpose u transpose. So order is swapped is u transpose z transpose transpose and two transposes cancel. So it's u transpose z. That's okay because that's what we have here. So we have this and that already looks a bit positive and we write v transpose v as the Euclidean norm squared. So that's expectation of norm of v squared. That's what v transpose v is. And this thing here, norm squared is always positive. The norm already is positive. And if we square it, it's even more positive. So that's positive. So we get u transpose covariance that u is positive and that's what we needed. That was the condition here. It tells us covariance that is positive semi-definite. I'm not sure whether we are ever going to use this property in this module, but it's a useful thing to know. So, and that's all I wanted to tell you here about covariance matrices. Okay, so that was the longest and probably also the most complicated of these three videos which make up this section. And in the next video coming up straight away, we will discuss the multivariate normal distribution.